Hey, welcome to the Smarter Tech Podcast. I'm here with mold remediation expert, Michael Rubino. Michael, thanks uh, for being here. I uh, really appreciate you coming. Nick, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. Sure. And uh, I think you reached out or maybe I reached out. I never quite remember where the intro was. I think it was months and months ago. So I'm very excited yeah. to to talk to you. You you came as highly credentialed and also highly uh I mean, publicized. You've been on on Goop. Uh, you're 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 with the um, also with uh, the Deepak Chopra um, yeah. Association. Please talk a little bit about this because to me, it it just shows that uh, people are sharing your information very widely. So it's really an honor that you're. <laughs> Let's say you're taking yeah. on the smaller show here for, with Smarter Tech and taking time to uh, share your expertise with us. Well, no, I really appreciate your show. So uh, I'm glad to be a part of oh, it. Oh, thank you. Um, and and how I got really involved with uh, Goop is is pretty interesting. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow is actually a client of mine, okay. uh, who wasn't wow. feeling well. Kids were not feeling well, and through fixing her home and finding issues that, frankly, uh, she had many inspectors and many uh, remediation companies out to her home to do certain things, and unfortunately, they didn't do them correctly, mm. uh, which led to this issue of her not feeling well. After working with her, we actually got to the root cause of the problem. We're able to fix that for her. I was just at her place last week. Uh, it smells different. I mean, it just smells so fresh and so clean. Um, it, there's just a different aura there. And she is absolutely, uh, extremely thrilled uh, to have this new environment. Um, when we look at that, obviously, people are starting to realize that there's something going on in their home that can impact their health. And obviously what you're doing in the EMF space is so important because Thank electromagnetic you. frequencies also create similar issues uh, yeah. with our health and, and the problems with our health. And mold is just something that is a fungus among us that can really take shape um, very quickly and can, can cross contaminate a home very quickly, uh, which can lead to certain sensitivities in people that creates these adverse health reactions. Um, Deepak Chopra, I got invited to, um, a retreat he was hosting, uh, about last year. And, uh, just through that retreat and getting to know him and getting to know the Chopra foundation, what they're about and talking about air quality and how important it is. Uh, he quickly was attracted to the fact that there's something there, um, and something that he himself hasn't, um, thought much about uh, in his conquest for improved longevity. So there was a lot of synergy there. Um, and so it, it just, it's happened very fast. Um, after I wrote the book, The Mold Medic and Experts Got on Mold Removal, uh, really people started to make sense of the principles that I've been using the past 10 years to help folks, uh, especially from a health perspective. And I think it's it started to take shape uh, in a life on its, of its own. So um, you know, I'm really grateful that I, you know, saw what I saw uh, after Hurricane Sandy, um, started noticing a pattern of people not feeling well and, yeah. you know, giving a damn enough to, you know, just figure it out, whatever it took. And it wasn't easy. I mean, I failed a bunch of times. I, I tried, I tried everything I possibly could and had to come up with new techniques and processes to essentially continue to move the needle forward and create something that worked home to home, um, which is not easy to do. Yeah, well, you're describing exactly the process that my colleague, Brian Hoyer, who's one of the top EMF mitigation specialists, and I would argue in the world, I don't know all of them, maybe that's a little bit too much, but I, I know he, he really knows his stuff. And him, it, for him, it was training, yes, with various institutes and whatnot in the EMF space, but also learning true remediation. And this is really what I realize is a lot of inspectors are missing things when it comes to EMFs. And I know that the same thing is happening when it comes to uh, air quality and mold. Uh, please let us know. You know, I, I'm still confused about mold because um, I, I had I the, my entire adventure with mold started two or three years ago when my practitioner, Dr. Tim Jackson, told me, Nick, you probably have mold at home or in your diet. And why did he, he tell me that? That's because I took a notes test. That's a urine test, organic acids. Sure. And I had the, these metabolites as if my body is metabolizing aspergillus and various mold toxins. And he told me, Nick, look, 
if you don't detox these molds, maybe you feel okay right now. And I did feel pretty healthy. And so I'm not the example of mold toxic and very sick. I'm, I'm the example of someone who gets told by their doc, if you remove this, then you're going to heal your gut. You're going to really ameliorate your health in a major way. I still had acne. I still have bouts of it if I, I took a plane yesterday. So, you know, my I, I know my health very well, but I know that this was a big issue for me. It represented like the number one thing I needed to fix. So I really embarked on this journey of trying to understand, okay, where, where does the mold come from? And I did take a test and whatnot. But for the average person, I realized that I, I was extremely confused and I'm still, I'm still are confused. <laughs> I'm still, I'm sure. confused. <laughs> so where should people start if they suspect and maybe what are the tell signs that maybe my whole, my home is problematic when it comes to mold? Is it, is it the odor? Is it that you do a test because it, sometimes there's no odor? So walk us through that. Like what are the first steps that people should take to say, okay, well, maybe it's part of why I have these health symptoms. So, you know, there's a, the old way of doing things is not the way that I like to do things, but I'm going to explain that way and then explain why uh, okay. to kind of bring the story together. You would, you suspected you had poor air quality, right? Maybe you had some mold, maybe there's some bacteria, what have you. You would traditionally call an inspector. They would come to your home and they would take an air sample because yeah. it makes sense. Air quality, air sample, we got this, but what we found out is that the air sample only really detects isolated spores around a three foot radius. Isolated meaning it's produced, maybe it's produced from behind the wall, it gets in front of the wall, it's free floating, and it's picked up into this pump, uh, then through microscopy it's analyzed, okay? Here's the issue. There's a lot of mold that settles in our dust. And if you know about dust, our dust is pretty much everywhere. Once it settles and binds with the dust and it recirculates around the house, if you do an air test, the dust is too big to fit inside the machine. Therefore, you're actually going to miss most of what you're exposed to. So the new way of doing things, the way that I believe is the right way to screen your home to understand if you have a problem is by using PCR technology to test your dust because that's really the most of what you're exposed to. Now there's a place for air testing. Air testing is brilliant at picking up sources, but you have to test close to where the sources are. So the best way to do that is if you think there's mold in a corner, test right on that on top of that corner. Or better yet, you could poke a hole through the wall where that corner is, stick a tube through it, connect it to the pump, and you can draw air from mm. behind the wall okay. to see if that's impacted where that is. Uh, but most people don't do that. They just because it's just been the thing for the past 35 years. No, we set up a pump in the middle of the house and that's how we tell. And the, the thing is, if you actually calculate it, let's say like a 2000 square foot home, you would need a hundred air tests to, to, to really expensive. determine, to yeah. really determine what you're being exposed to throughout the home. And at $95 a pop or a hundred, I don't know what, I don't know what they cost these days, but that's a, that's a lot. Um, when you can spend a couple hundred bucks to actually analyze your dust. So that's why I have been, you know, pushing for dust test technology over the past couple of years, um, created, created my own test, working with EMSL, which is a very uh, large lab in the U.S., to create a product that is easy to understand, easy to read, that people can understand. Because before that, you had to rely on what's called ERMI. Have you heard of ERMI? Uh, I, I did one at home, yeah. Okay. And I love ERMI for the data. But the score is what kind of throws people in a tailspin. Yeah. It was, yeah, at least I had someone who told me about the scores and not to worry too much about it. But yeah, yeah. without interpretation, I would have found it pretty overwhelming, at least. Totally. Like pretty alarming. <laughs> and anything that has to be interpreted without right. interpretation is dangerous, right? Because yes, I agree. we set us up we set us up for people saying incorrect things, which is what happens. Yeah. You know, I've had, it, when, when ERMI technology first started becoming widely used, I would say 2017, 18, somewhere around that time, you would have doctors telling patients, you need an ERMI below a two. But if you know how the scoring algorithm works, you can't really control those factors. 
because essentially as long as you have less molds that are indoor than outdoor, you're going to get a negative score. But if there are certain influences from outside to inside, like from our soffit vents, for example, that allow mold from outside to come inside, you can have a negative score, but you could still have levels of mold inside your home that you don't want. And so it's okay. really interesting how the scoring methodology has played out over time. Uh, I was one of those early adopters that said, okay, I guess we have to figure out how to get it below a two. And after 10, you know, six, seven years of trying to figure out how to get it below a two, realized that it's just not possible to control the actual score, the way in which the algorithm is created. Yeah. So the better thing to do is look at the data. And, you know, if you look at an ERMI, you see different stars next to different mold species. One star means it's 10 times higher, two stars 100 times higher, three stars 1,000 times higher. So we have a, a reference of what's normal uh, and what's abnormal. And we have ways to detect what is abnormal, where it's coming from, uh, so we can eradicate that and get it more towards that normal range. Does everything need to be normal? Uh, that's going to depend on the person. Uh, some people can tolerate probably higher species of molds in certain aspects where others may not. So it's going to depend on the person. And I love that you can take that data and correlate it with, like you said, the oats test or mycotoxin test. Yeah. Because if, if something is built up in somebody's system, that means they're having a hard time removing it naturally. Yeah. And when that's happening, that means that they must be more sensitive to that specific toxin than maybe the average person. So it's really interesting because they can kind of help build shape around what we need to do to the home to really fix it. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to bridge the medical and scientific community together, perhaps for, for one of the first times it's ever happened. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, as pioneering this industry is let's actually make use of the tools and technology that we have to make people's lives better. Yeah, a hundred percent. And what's the difference between the army and then the test that you developed? This is it still based on uh, taking samples of dust? Still based on samples of dust. Uh, the difference is, is that you'll be able to get all of the technology in the same place. Um, you know, we convinced a lab to make an investment to be able to provide more analysis than they typically have done before in the past. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we have, uh, we have also pared down, we got rid of the score because the score is confusing and not helpful. We don't want to give people information that isn't useful. Yeah. Instead of the score, based upon all of the uh, data that we have, because I partnered with another company called We Inspect to do this, uh, so that we can take our data and their data and put it together and have more data uh, than what the EPA has done in, in their ERMI study, and be able to utilize that data and understand okay, if they have these types of molds and these types of quantities, how many sources might they have? And we know that based upon all of the remediation that I've done over the past 10 years. Interesting. And what likelihood might they have mycotoxins? And we know that through all the inspections that the other company has done over the years. And this really gives us a, a good frame of reference for folks to say, all right, I may have mycotoxins based upon this analysis. Of course, they can just test for the mycotoxins, but we have different packages so that everybody can afford this. Um, we also have an understanding of how many sources may they have. Well, that can tell, tell them what this may cost if they want to you know, create a healthier environment because they may have to address five different sources in their home. Uh, this is all actionable data. We also give them kind of a range of a cost analysis, like what it, what it may take to make this house perfect. We also created a, a, uh, the economics of what it costs to move because so many people say, should I stay or should I go? Yeah. Well, now you'll have sort of a cost analysis of here's what it looks like to stay, here's what it looks like to go, right? Because there's, there's an economical impact of now I got to sell my house for less. I have to disclose that there's mold. There's all that economics to take into. There's moving costs associated. There's buying a new house and the closing costs associated with that. We wanted people to have unbiased information of what this actually is going to take so they can make the proper decision because there's so much misinformation out there that people don't really have the information they need to make a sound decision. Uh, and we hope that with the dust test, uh, they will have that for, for possibly the first time um, 
And my goal is to put the power back into the hands of the people because we rely on professionals that aren't so professional. And that really is what put us into the situation where you're confused. Frankly, probably everybody listening is confused. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that's good. You know, you have the same philosophy again, just bringing back the my colleague, Brian, who is never really satisfied with what's out there. He's like, oh, no, we need to develop this because this is lacking. So really, when I find pioneers, I'm very, very interested, interested to see why, like, what is their, their journey. So it's very, very interesting that you, you ended up developing your own tools, just like Brian developed his own his own team, yeah. his own methodology, his own EMF meters and, and how he tests things and how there, there's, there's ne there needs to be retesting after we install a mitigation strategy such as a, right. a canopy over the bed because you need to test it. And he just realized that, yeah, I might uh, have higher overhead for my company because we need to test twice. But the reality is that most people screw up their installation of a canopy and he doesn't want to leave people with a bad mitigation. So that that's, again, that's... It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's, it's how we practice, right? We're, we're dealing with microscopic particles. EMFs are also microscopic particles. You yeah. can't see them, right? Yeah. So how do, you deal with, how do you deal with making sure you did a good job? You have to test. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. listen, I, I want to I wanna save the world, but there's only so many limitations that, that I can work with. And even if I'm quote unquote, the best at what I do, it don't, it, it doesn't mean that I have x-ray vision that I see behind walls. It doesn't mean that I have microscopic vision that I could see 50 times smaller than what the normal eye can see. We have to validate, you know, yeah. we have good intentions, but without validation, we just don't, we can't ever be sure that we fully got it all. And I push that on clients so much because so many clients feel so comfortable in working with us that they forget and lose sight of the fact that we care about you. And that's why you need to test because we guarantee that we'll come back and fix it if we need to. And we have to make sure and be sure so that we know we close the loop on this. So I love Brian's philosophy on that. And yeah, of course it makes us more expensive because we have to come back, we have to guarantee things. But at the end of the day, if we're doing this from a health perspective, cutting corners is not the answer. No, for sure. And and please talk about the the different degrees of sensitivity. I think this is a perfect segue because for some people, uh, what I see in the EMF space is electro hypersensitivity where they cannot even stay close to a phone. I mean, some people, of course, cannot live in a city. So that's extreme sensitivity where literally you're you're in the middle of a buzzing city with all these towers and whatnot. You cannot tolerate it. What about people who get sick from their home. Maybe they've been in the home for several decades and there were major issues. Uh, do you have special cases or let's say overall symptoms that people that you, that you would say, oh yeah, that's probably related to mold sensitivity? We had a client who uh, was so sick over the, over the course of about two years. She actually had to install a GJ feeding tube to get her the nutrients she needed to survive. Because every time she ate, she would throw up. She wasn't able to keep consistently keep food down. She was diagnosed with POTS, um, everything under the sun you can think of. She had over 40 different doctors that she went to to diagnose her with problems. It was the 40th doctor who was like, you know, this is gonna sound crazy, but I think you have mold. What, was it Dietrich Klinghardt or something? <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know, another yeah. person in environmental medicine or? It, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a, I think, I believe a naturopathic doctor or something to that effect. Yeah, that's um, smart. Within seven days of her moving out, just so we could start the project. So we didn't even start yet. She just moved out. She rented an RV. She's living in this 450 square foot RV on the side of her property. Uh, within seven days, she gets the GJ feeding tube removed. She was bedridden. She was in wheelchairs. She was walking again after those seven days. She was making her kids food. She had three little kids that she couldn't care for while she yeah. got that sick. Wow. Uh, huge transformation. I mean, night and day from when we first saw her to by the time we finished her home. These are some of the severe cases that I see. I've worked with people who were so sensitive to light and sound, they couldn't leave their room. Uh, yeah. Had to have literally installation of technology to keep that room soundproofed and dark. 
Um, also I've heard, I've had clients where I've, you know, walked, knocked on their door, they answer, start immediately asking me, do you have a cell phone? Do you have a, any sort of technology on you? Because I get my skin actually burns yes. when these things are around. Yeah. No problem. It was the first that I have heard at, at the time I was in my, in my twenties. First time that I have heard at the time that, uh, something like that could exist, these types of sensitivities. And I found them absolutely remarkable. Where, where many people um, from our society would suggest that these people are crazy, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, what is it here that is causing this person, even let's, let's just say, even if it wasn't real, which we know it is, if, if it's real in their mind, it's real, right? And I learned that early on is that everybody has their own viewpoints. Even if something may not be in agreement from a societal standpoint, that doesn't mean that it's any less real to them. And pain is all subjective. It's not yeah, objective. That's true. I don't feel your pain. You feel your pain. If you are in pain, that is real. And so as I, as I started to unpack this and started going down my rabbit holes, I, I really just concreted the fact that we're all different. We all have different immune systems. We all have different triggers for those immune systems. Now, she had every wire grounded in her house. She had no Wi-Fi. Everything was hardwired. Uh, she had one computer, and it was a 1996, I think, Dell computer or something yeah. to that, that effect. I mean, not didn't have any new technology. There was no microwave in her home. She cooked everything on the stove. Um, it, it, was, it was remarkable to see. <clears throat> and as she told me her, her journey, she wasn't born this way. She was totally fine. She was able to use a cell phone, computer, didn't matter. But over time, she got so sensitive. She believed it was due to the mold. Um, that was her, her theory. Uh, you know, we don't know. I think we're very early on in the study of medicine here. I think we just now are starting to develop tools and technologies to be able to correlate data with people's homes and their bodies. So yeah. I think we're going to learn a lot more over time. Um, but, you know, if that's her theory and that's what she believes, I have no reason to disbelieve her. Um, so I'm very interested in seeing how things develop on that front. But I, I, I still find it remarkable how, for whatever reason, this perfect storm happens that weakens somebody's immune system so much so that they become sensitive to their surroundings. They become hypersensitive to EMFs, hypersensitive to mold, uh, sometimes light and sound. Yeah. Um, it, it could be a remarkable thing. And it all seems to be intertwined by the way, it's something going on in the home that isn't supposed to be going on. And it's not always mold. Sometimes it is EMFs, right? But it's looking at the home in a new way and being able to identify some of the pitfalls the home may have, like mold, like bacteria, like EMFs, that can either make us thrive or the opposite. Yeah, that's profound. I mean, 100%, this is in, in sensitivities, there's there's increasingly there's scientific proof that a lot of people are, let's say, mold sensitivity and EMF sensitivity. They just uh, and even uh, chemical sensitivity. Uh, people that have that have had the exposures to uh, large amounts of pesticides, for example, workers in fields where there's uh, heavy pesticide use, or in in certain workplaces where they have to handle chemicals, they have exposures there a couple of years. They realize they become EMF sensitive, and that's really. I think it's really the body's defenses are down. Their antioxidant levels are probably low, and when you look at those people, they just the system is overwhelmed and and has uh, become so sensitive and so weak that um, extreme measures need, need need really to be taken on the EMF side of things, on the chemical side of things, and mold, but also everything else. And that's that's really the shame. There's there's hope for recovery. I know I I talked with doctors who see these patients, including mold toxic all the time, electrosensitive, and they get them better. But it's not an easy thing to do. It's not a promise that uh, um, it can be done. But what have you seen as far as recoveries go, right? I'm interested to see, I know Brian Hoyer has shared with me, for example, some people that uh, have a certain medication. I know I'm not telling people, of course, to dis discontinue their medication, but just an anecdote with someone who taking 
thyroid medication. And after the EMF remediation, they realized that they were hyperthyroid now. Uh, so in, in a sense, their medication now was too strong because their body mm. was coming back to homeostasis in a low EMF environment versus the high EMF. So uh, possibly for a lot of reasons, you're just recovering. You're just back to where normal should be because your thyroid should be working normally. So what have you seen when it comes to before and after mold remediation in someone's home? Well, as you know, as I discussed earlier this this woman who in seven days i mean had a remarkable recovery um yeah i would say most people they they begin to heal you know they're they're in working with a conjunction with a doctor they're taking different you know supplements to support whatever it is that's imbalanced inside their body um they no longer have this exposure to be fighting for uh, when we when we break it down into like science, and I'm not a medical doctor, right? So always sure. consult with your doctor on on these things. But my my understanding of this is that there are an excess of particles that our body is fighting to remove, and these excess of particles and toxins they get stored in the fat cells, of the fat layer of our cells. So what are EMFs? They're radiation particles. That's what they are. And they get stored in our cells. Now our body has to fight to remove these things. They can change our cells. They can do things like cause cancer, right? Because what is cancer? It's disrupted cells that continuously divide yeah. with no end in sight. That's what cancer is. Uh, I just saw an article on BBC that said air pollution is the largest leading factor in cancer across the world. Air pollution. I'm not doubting that. Yeah. What's air pollution? Well, mold, bacteria, viruses, EMFs, radiation. This is, these are the, the common, of course, gases and chemicals and things of that nature. But, you know, these are some of the things. Now, we spend 90% of our time indoors, right? That's a study from the EPA, 90% of our time indoors. Mm -hmm. So I'm more concerned personally about indoor pollution than I am outdoor pollution at this exact moment. Not that I'm not concerned about the environment changing, because I think that also has a factor on our indoor pollution. But just from this statistical speaking, I'm talking about if I don't have my indoor environment safe, where I spend 90% of my time, and 90% is definitely accurate. I mean, I'm outside doing walks and things of that nature, but I'm inside right now talking to you. And yeah. after you, I'm probably going to be inside talking to the next person. And it just goes on and on and on. Before you yeah. know it, now I'm sleeping inside my home. I'm working inside my home. I'm majority of the time at home. And it's true for so many people. This is what we're exposed to. And we have things like radiation, mold, bacteria that we're constantly exposed to, but they're particles. And we're inhaling these particles. They're in radiations coming right through our skin, uh, being absorbed into our skin, into the cells right from there. Um, mold, bacteria, we're inhaling them. Viruses, we're typically inhaling them. Um, and as we inhale these things, what happens? They're so small, they bypass our self-defense mechanisms. They immediately enter our bloodstream. Uh, there's some studies suggesting that from there they get it, they impact our gut, uh, which impacts our brain, right? And that's why you have these symptoms like brain fog and chronic fatigue when we're exposed to too many particles. You know, EMF exposure sounds a lot like mold exposure, which sounds a lot like Lyme, which sounds a lot like MCAS, which sounds a lot <laughs> like Hashimoto's, which sounds a lot. It's true. What if what if all of this is so simple and we're being so complex? <laughs> what if the simplicity of it is, yeah. doesn't matter if it's a radiation particle, a fungal particle, a bacteria particle, a virus particle, if you have too many particles in your body, you will not feel well. What if it's as simple as that? It's pretty simple because when you look at animals, if an animal is sick, we would say, okay, well, what's wrong? Is it the diet? Is it... But when... <laughs> With humans, it's like, okay, what pill do we need? It's, it's the entire model is a little bit simpler and I think more accurate for like animal care <laughs> than human care. I, I We're know. We're very I complicated know. in how we treat those. It, it presents this problem where, you know, because of the way our medical system is, we've lost sight of looking for the answers, right? Because yeah. it's just like, well, we don't need an answer. We just need a label and we just need a pill for that label to give them some relief. But you ever ask, like when you talk to a doctor and obviously not all doctors are the same, but just when you go talk to just a regular doctor at a random place, at a random clinic up the street, right? 
they're going to prescribe medication typically for anything that you're dealing with. Um, if it's warranted and you, you are legitimately diagnosed with something, but you know what they never tell you how to get off the medication. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's just yeah. like, take this. Okay. Twice a day. Yeah. Take it twice a day. Good. Okay. Yeah. yeah just take it twice a day. Good. When do I stop taking it? Well, you may never stop taking it. What do you mean? <laughs> what That's, is, yeah, what, what has changed? What has changed internally that re now requires me to take this to, st to, to live a normal life? Yeah. And we, we stopped answering those questions because if we answer those questions, we won't need the pills, right? Yeah, and, and also it puts other people in trouble, <laughs> other industries. When it comes to mold, it's, well, it, I mean, EMF, of course, we can put the blame. Oh, it's the telecoms, it's this and that. And mm -hmm. yeah, they have part of the responsibility in, in how they, I think, disregard safety or let's say they put safety in other agencies' hands and those agencies say, oh, well, it's not us, it's that other agency. So anyway, it's kind right. of a... the the crazy uh ping pong play when it comes to you at least in the u.s and and canada from what Who's i know on but first <laughs> yeah and um but when it comes to mold what's the main culprit uh that you see in people's home where you can say okay well this happened now there's mold is it of course katrina uh like there's flooding of course this creates mold if not uh if, if you don't dry the place out uh, extremely carefully but what else is it just you know leaking of pipes or things like that well there's no doubt that natural disasters cost billions if not trillions of dollars in damages that do not get properly managed um yeah. not not trying to throw shade at fema or any of these organizations i'm just simply stating that the technology that we work with in a remediation setting uh, during these natural disasters is not very great. Um, basically what happens when you have a natural disaster is uh, typically the guard comes, um, you companies come in from all over the place to capitalize on the opportunity to not only make some money, but of, of course also restore the properties. Um, and this is companies from all over the place, not just local companies that just, just, you'll just see trucks of equipment and people coming in to save the day. Well, there is no oversight in these situations. There is almost no testing in these situations. And it creates a situation where people come in, they fix homes or they do what they feel is right, but they don't verify. It all happens so fast because there's so much pressure to get this house done and move on to the next house. Yeah that unfortunately these houses that are spent to be fixed if maybe 10 percent more were spent could have been totally fixed but because it's not totally fixed it begins to go downhill um, for seven years after hurricane sandy i was still re-remediating homes that were supposedly remediated in this time period um, so it goes to show you that there is uh, a lot of problems with the way in which we handle natural disasters. Um, problems that I think are evil, easily solved, but require some structure and oversight. And I know in a natural disaster, everyone wants to act fast um, and rightfully so, but there's a way in which you, you act fast without cutting corners. And that's really the, the simplicity. And I think for, so, for far too long, people didn't think this was a big deal. Like they looked at it more as unsightly or unpleasantly unpleasant odors. They didn't see it as this big health effect. And so True. as we start to learn more and more and more, and we have to take this more and more serious, we're going to have to develop better plants for the future because it, our lives depend on it. Um, I think with um, the other aspect of just people's homes that aren't in natural disasters, you know, if you have a home built in 1976, well, it's 2022. Uh, the average statistic is that one out of every 10 years, you will have some sort of water event. We know that water is the catalyst for things like mold and bacteria inside of our homes. Uh, and in 1976, let's just say your water event was eight, 1986. Well, I can tell you in 1986, they weren't remediating. Yeah, they, they were just painting over it. Fast forward to 1996. Now we're starting to get a little more lawsuits around mold. People are starting to wake up that there's some health effects. 
but they're still not doing it right because they didn't have the tools and technology back then to really do it right. Fast forward to 2006, <clears throat> definitely have more opportunity for things to be getting done right. Um, you know, the ERMI wasn't in existence back then. So you didn't have, people weren't understanding uh, that mold creates particles and these particles move throughout your home. We call that cross-contamination today. Um, but so we would re remove the, the mold on the wall, maybe did a pretty good job at that, but all the particles were still spread throughout the home, still breathing it in, still circulating through the HVAC system. We really started learning shortly after that the HVAC system was a big piece of this puzzle because it has a coil, it condensates, provides a wet environment for mold and bacteria to thrive. You have mold growing in your bathroom. Now you have mold growing in your HVAC and now your HVAC is a mold factory, if you will. Mm. Uh, so still today in 2022, we have inspectors, some of them sitting on the board of, you know, big uh, organizations that help write standards and protocols that do not believe that HVAC machines play a big part in this, that mold can't really grow in an HVAC machine. I have so much data, real life data of tests of HVAC machines that would say otherwise. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important that we educate ourselves because, you know, we're someday we're going to need a professional um, some, some sooner than others, unfortunately. And we actually want to be more professional than the professionals because we want to know that what they're saying to us and what they're selling us is accurate. Because if it's not, we're going to be sold something that is unlikely to get us where we want to go. And it's going to cost us money, but not get us the result we're looking for. And that's happened so many times in my career where people come to me and say, well, I've already spent X amount of dollars on this. Yeah. And it's like, well, I understand, but it wasn't done right, right? So I'm sure the same thing happens in the EMF world. Classic. Guy says, I'm going to mitigate yeah. it, spend all this money, and it's not cheap, right? And you say, well, it has to be done again because we're still picking up readings. We're still picking up particles coming off of this device. Exactly. Whatever it may be. And this is where we're in. 10 years from now, I suspect that we'll be in a better place, but we have to face reality now. And we have to make sure we're vetting the professionals we let into our homes because our homes and the quality of air that we're breathing and the particles that we're exposed to really matter. This is this is brilliant, uh, Michael. This is I, I think it gives a lot of, of hope, but also I think it's very sobering when it comes to choosing the right professionals. And that's something I learned from my colleague, Brian. Of course, I'm not an EMF mitigation specialist. I I thought about doing courses and whatnot, maybe it will be a, f a future part of my uh, portfolio, but I'm mostly, you know, information and interviews and these kind of things. And for, for the mitigation part, I talked with Brian, but again, everything you said is so accurate. He, he tells me these stories, he goes in, in people's place. And what I tell people is do not try to do a very um, technical remediation when it comes to EMF by yourself. With, with no specialist telling, oh, well, I'll save a thousand bucks, right? I won't call Brian. I won't call a building biology expert. No, I'll just do it myself. And then I'll take a cheap meter off of Amazon and, oh, the readings are fine. I mean, if, that, if you put that level of attention, you don't expect results to necessarily be good. And that's the thing. If you're sensitive, then you, you got to get it right. You got to get it right. So, so the same thing can be said. Please let me know about your company. Uh, is it is it Home Clean? I know you have the book. Yeah. How can people work with your company? Where do you do, you do U.S., Canada, Singapore? I don't know. Like, let, so, let us know a little uh, bit about your services. Yeah. So um, before my company's name is Home Cleanse. Uh, it's a company I founded that has products and services to help you get what you need out of your home, which is you know finding out what's wrong with it. Uh, there's a, always at least one or two things wrong with our home, if not more. So it's good to get the information to be able to make an empowered decision on, on what you want to do. Should you decide you need someone like us, we're happy to help. Um, but that's not the name of the game. You know, the name of the game is propel the industry forward to give people information they need to make the right decisions. Um, I am a firm believer in being data driven. There's nothing that I will tell you that I cannot back up by data. Um, 
what I want to make a really interesting statement that I think uh, ties really nicely into what you were just saying before. Sure. Um, I spoke to a, a woman. Uh, she was probably in her fifties, maybe early sixties. Okay. And you, she was, she told me something about um, the, just the cost of remediation. She's like, you know, Michael, I got really sick from mold. I never took it seriously. Now I'm, now I'm, you know, now I'm taking it seriously. And I said to her, you know, based upon her situation, you know, that something like what she was going through could be somewhere around the 30 to $50,000 ballpark, right? Which is a lot of money for anybody. Yeah. Um, and what she had told me was, you know, Michael, but had I known that, okay, and had I, knowing what I know now, that is a drop in the bucket compared to the $350,000 medical bill that I'm dealing with for not taking care of this for not believing in it, for not taking care of it. Yeah. And I just found that remarkable. First off, because, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't aware of how expensive the medical costs can really get, especially with hospital visits and that and that type yeah. of thing. Um, but, you know, it goes to show you that a little bit of money up front to be proactive inside your home can save you a lot of money and heartache and health issues in the long run. And I think it's so important because, like I said, it's more than mold, right? It's EMFs, it's mold, it's bacteria. There's all these VOCs, formaldehyde, our household chemicals. It's taking a look at all of these things and saying, how could I make improvements to my environment so that when I come home at night and I go to bed, it is a sanctuary, it's a safe place, it's a place of healing and not a place where, of illness because that's how we get ill. We Our system is so not proactive right? We don't go to the doctor until we're sick, until we've had problems, until it's too late. Now we have to reverse course. And we don't need to do that. And I think if we keep a healthy home, I suspect that a healthy home is going to reverse some mysterious illnesses <laughs> that we have on this yeah. planet. I'm telling you. And I, 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 it's a hunch. I'm not a doctor. I can't make these types of definitive statements. But I'll tell you, if I'm betting, I am betting that that is true. I agree, a hundred percent. Let us know a little bit about how your company works. Is it just you? Do you have inspectors that work under you or with you? Because I mean, if it's just you, there's only so so, so many hours you can put in. So you're probably in yeah. demand. Yeah. So me myself, I do. Uh, I, I'm I'm not working inside of people's homes traditionally uh, anymore. I, we have a company of about sixty employees. Um, from everything from design, like looking over results and designing a plan of action to eradicate those results. Obviously right. not every source is created equal. Uh, and so you want to look at what's cost versus worth, uh, tearing open walls to remove a minutia amount of mold that is not toxic is not going to be money well spent of opening a wall that has a lot of mold that could be toxic, right? So you want to look at some of these things and put together a cost analysis, which is kind of step one of working with us. We have a whole team of people that that have been trained by me to, to help you with that. And then we have uh, people that come to your home all across the country, the U.S., to do these cost analysis. Uh, we've we have uh, we've opened the door to service people in other countries, but it is a bit of a nightmare because there's visas involved mm -hmm. um, and we're taking our own people for right now and, and doing that. We do have an M&A plan to be able to expand in other countries but we're, we're probably a year out from that plan being executed and implemented. So for now, we can work with you, but there's a bit of a delay and it's a bit of a hassle. Um, but if you're game, we're game, um, you know, in that sense. Uh, I also do consults. So, you know, if you're just confused about what to do and you want to know where to start, I help guide you through that process. Uh, I do hour-long consults through Zoom. Um, I Zoom with people all over the world because there's a lot of countries that don't have people that are, uh, that understand the microbiological effects um, and how to do this, not only just from a cosmetic standpoint, but from a scientific standpoint. So I, I help people wherever I possibly can. And the future is we're looking to create uh, more accessibility in this space because you know it, it can get expensive, especially if you're dealing with a lot of issues at once. So uh, that's that's kind of the plan, and we're we're helping to do that through uh, my foundation called Change the Air Foundation which is geared towards education, uh, research, um, financial assistance, everything that we need to kind of make air quality a big piece of government assistance in the future. 
That's tremendous. I, I love it that you're so passionate about the topic that you don't just do your job and see as many clients as possible, but try to advance the topic. And this is this is really key. Uh, I think uh, your your passion really shines through. And of course, there's your book. Please talk about the Mold Medic. I think it came out. Um, I, I don't recall. Is it a few years back? Yeah. That you wrote yeah, this guy. Al already, it's uh, it's been a couple of years. Came out December 2020. Um, it is called the Mold Medic and Experts Guide on Mold Removal. Um, and I wrote that. I've been writing the book for a long time, uh, but essentially little by little. Uh, through the when the pandemic hit, I had a lot more time to finish it up, which um, I know a lot of us, you know, had a lot of more free time than we would have liked. And so I, you <laughs> yeah. know, I, I I finished up the book in in 2020, but um, been writing it for a long time, and it's it's really been a a remarkable journey. Um, the whole idea of the book was once I started stumbling upon the fact that the industry. Like if you pick up the phone, you call, you know, water dryer 972 down the street, you know, they don't actually understand what they're doing from a scientific perspective. And as I started really seeing this, because there's a pattern of people getting sick after being remediated and it, it, there was no like one company, it was every freaking company that was doing business, big national companies, you know, doing business. Uh, you know, supposedly making sure that it, you know, like it never happened. It may look like it never happened, but scientifically you still saw that there was something there. Yeah. And it was through that passion of trying to figure out what it took to, to fix it uh, that led me to write this book because I didn't want to just have the information to myself. I wanted everyone to have the information. So I kind of outlined the whole story from start to finish, all the different steps you need to take to do this right uh, for those who are doing it themselves, um, you know, there's no visual guidance there, but certainly the information's there. You can start to understand the concepts of this. And I'm, I'm big into education. I think, you know, what I'd like to do is create a lot more educational resources. We built a school inside one of our warehouses um, to hopefully train other businesses, uh, certainly to train our own people. Um, and we've been started to film these these segments so we can create some sort of system online for people to get the information and learn. Um, so this, that's the type of things that I'm, I'm extremely passionate about. Well, I'm excited that you're getting more online because this information need, needs to be there. There's many people, uh, there's there's one course that I followed myself that was a good class with Leslie uh, Herman. Uh, there's many people in envir envir environmental medicine that are trying things, but I mean, there's there's so much open space for people who want to publish great quality courses on this because yeah. i think that when uh you know you've got gwyneth paltrow and deepak chopra when when these health authorities are getting interested in the topic of mold then it's a little bit less controversial than emfs in my mind so at least it's, it's great that they are uh getting convinced by their own experience or by seeing the science and then the before and after of their own colleagues sometimes that that I know in the EMF space, unfortunately, most of them I cannot speak about because Brian told me in confidence, but a lot of people in Hollywood, top CEOs of Fortune 500 are getting their home remediated for, the, for EMFs. Uh, they're not telling about it because it does sound a little bit woo-woo and crazy right now. But the more, eventually, the more people come out saying, you know, I've removed the frequencies from my home and I feel better and here's a science. Eventually, it, you know, the, the topic grows in credibility. And I, uh, I'm very glad that you're part of this movement to make mold more, more of it. It's not something that there's, there's this old, crazy person in. We see that in the media. That's all mo that freaks out about mold. But in the end, it was just, you know, paranoia. It's real. And, and it, that's something that Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof executive, has been talking about for years. And I'm very glad that you're pushing this forward really well it and, and i'll say that emf is not woo woo not not even a little bit no i know this what was <laughs> that's why this what was the title that, of my book but yeah <laughs> i'm drawing a blank but as you said that to me i was like you know what if people just looked at this what was that reactor in ukraine that blew up uh in, you, you, chernobyl you, you mean chernobyl okay so for those that don't know the chernobyl reactor blew up right? And it leaked radiation, which yeah. is EMFs, guys, uh, into the environment. That whole area 
is completely contaminated. People have had to evacuate for 50 years. They're saying it's another 50 years before it'll be safe enough to live there again. So this is what radiation is and what radiation does and why it's so toxic to our environment, to our people. Uh, it's really important that we don't take radiation for granted, right? And I know everyone listening to this podcast right now is like, dude, I'm an EMF pro. You know, I don't even know this. <laughs> yeah, like, and of course, this is ionizing radiation, but the non... the, the the entire the entire argument is is that non ionizing radiation. Oh no, that part doesn't do anything. But that's completely wrong. And that's that's kind of the it's the particles. fact that you cite Chernobyl is important to me because yes, this is exactly like Chernobyl, except we're all exposed to it at smaller doses, and then it kind of hacks away at our health long term. And I think right. mold also acts that that way. And it's the more you live in it, totally. and the more you know it accumulates. I I know it it can even my my doc told me uh, Tim Jackson that. That it can it can colonize in the sinuses and the more um environmental yeah. doctors mm -hmm. look at it the more the more bizarre it looks to be honest guys it's kind of gross how mold can kind of i don't know you have spores inside you i i, totally. <laughs> I don't want to think it's, about it's, it's it it's creepy it last creepy. reference of chernobyl chernobyl so we know that there's radiation contamination there yeah you guys got to look this up there is mold that is growing and eating the radiation particles, <laughs> I heard feeding off that. the radiation particles in Chernobyl. And why this is fascinating, because we all try to kill mold all the yeah. time. That's yeah. why we've used bleach. We want to paint over it. We just think that we'll kill it. Well, if this thing is eating radiation that would kill us if we even touched it, <laughs> it tells you how resilient mold really is. It's like the cockroach of, of, of our world here. Yeah. Um, Killing, it's not the answer, it's removing it. Remove it, discard it, get it out, and that's the key. And you remove the particles thereafter along with it. Um, you clean your HVAC system. This is the simplicity of what we need to do. And uh, hopefully that that ties it full circle for folks, and uh, hopefully they, they, they've learned a lot in this episode. Yeah, well, I'm sure I, I did learn a lot, and, and I think that what I'll do I, right now, I'm traveling all around the world as I'm recording those, and I'll be back home just in July of next year, so um, I know there's still mold in there, and I want to resume that uh, remediation. I'll probably take a consult with you, to be honest, just to, to make sure I'm on the right track, but I'll probably retest and see what's up and, and start uh, start by my bathroom, which is... Yeah, I know it's problematic. I just don't want to tear up the wall and see what's <laughs> what's on the other side. It's kind of a Pandora's box, right? I know. I'm like, it can be. You know? Yeah. But you I, have anyway. to think about like what what are the consequences of not doing that, you know? And you, you start to weigh those out. Yeah. I'd be I'd I'd be delighted to do a console with you. Would love to show you uh, you know, how how things work when I work with you and look over the results and the data and help come up together and, and put our heads together and make some decisions. I would love to do that. That'd be good. And you know what? Let's record it for the community if you're willing. And uh, I think it could Hands be a down. very, uh, it, it could give them a lot of insights about what's involved. So anyway, just uh, just a That'd bit of fantastic. a teaser for a part two. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. It's been uh, very informative. And my God, I, I really expected uh, to to learn things, but uh, this is above and beyond what I expected. I really found a new uh, a, a new colleague of mine. I'm very I'm very serious in that in how you think. You're a pioneer in your field, and you also have this passion for helping people. And this is not the uh, you know a discussion around uh, marketing your company or these kind of things. It goes way beyond that, and I can see it in you. And I'm very happy to uh, have connected with you. Thank you so much, and I know a lot of people will love and share this episode. Nick, I feel the same way. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to working together. Thank you so much.